Good morning, church, once again. We are coming close to the end of yet another year. Um, by the way, if you missed the announcements, I was trying to sing, and now I've just lost my voice. <laughs> it's something about singing, but um, yeah, Carol's on the lawn tonight at 7.30, Christmas program next week, picnic in the afternoon, um, and of course, the alternating service. Um, I've asked Nadia to be on standby to read Bible verses for me today in case my voice goes. But um, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, I, I should have done a short sermon. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, I, heard some, I heard a preacher say this once, you know. Uh, he doesn't believe in sermonettes because sermonettes are for Christianettes. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, I, I think it's funny. Um, <laughs> there are times where a short sermon is necessary, and that's okay. This is not one of those times. So pray for my voice, <clears throat> then I'll be able to sustain this. Um, I'd like to pray, so I invite you to bow your heads where you are. I would like to kneel as we get into our message for today. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to come before you in worship once again. Lord, I ask that um, you would hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. Lord, my additional prayer today is that um, you will sustain my voice on my throat and my cough and my chest. Um, as we open your words, may you not just open our minds, may you open our hearts as well. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we have finished our series on Daniel and Revelation, and we won't be starting another series until uh, probably February next year at the earliest, more likely towards the end of February, early March. So for the next couple of months, I mean, we're coming up to Christmas. We have two Christmas messages sort of line up back to back. And then um, we have a number of other speakers other than myself who will be sharing in January. So no sermon series per se, but that said, today's message follows up somewhat from last week's presentation on the millennium. So they're not linked per se, um, but there are similarities which will come up. Uh, you'll see as we journey together. The title of my presentation today is, as you can see on the screen, God will give you more than you can bear. God will give you more than you can bear. Now, at a first glance, some of you might think that title is blasphemous. How dare you say that God will give you more than you can bear? In fact, there's a very good chance that some of you, maybe all of us, have heard or made the statement that is opposite to the title you see on the screen, that God will not give you more than you can bear. So when someone's going through a tough time, I'm not talking about like, you know, just stomach ache or anything, something like a seriously tough time, and you don't know what to say, you struggle to find words, so you say things like, yep, God, love, God, God is love, God takes care of us, He has our best interests at heart, and inevitably, I used to hear this, and don't worry, God will not give you more than you can bear. Don't put your hand up. How many of you believe this to be true, that God never gives us more than we can handle or more than we can bear? Don't put your hand up. Of course you're thinking, it's a trick question, because the sermon title clearly says the opposite. I, how many of you have heard this? Just, you can put your hands up. How many of you have heard this statement being said before that God will not give you more than you can bear? Yep, okay. Most of us, right? Okay. I'm not going to ask how many of you have said it, but I believe that this statement, the statement that God does not give us more than we can bear, I believe that statement to be theologically and biblically inaccurate and incorrect. Because I do think that God does give us more than we can bear. You're thinking, but God is love, and that is true. But when someone's going through a really tough time, and someone goes, God will not give you more than you can bear, what they're effectively saying is, hey, look, you can handle this, because what you're handling, pull yourself together. 
God's not going to give you more than you're able to handle it, so handle it. Now, how would you feel if you were on the receiving end of this statement? How many of you would go, you know, you're going through a rough, difficult time, and somebody says to you, God will not give you more than you can bear. And you go, well, why didn't I think of that before? Well, thank you. I am now super happy. Thank you for cheering me up. You're right. Um, pain? Woohoo! Suffering? Bring it on. It's fantastic. Rock on heartache because God will not give me more than we can bear. So I can obviously handle this. So I'm going to handle it. Anyone? Anyone? Is that wet? Have you ever... Now, somewhat of an exaggeration, of course. But I will be hard-pressed to find anyone who is struggling and just going through a really, really difficult time, and somebody says this, God will not give you more than you can bear, and you find, oh, yes, thank you. You find immediate comfort. Or maybe you have. I'm not denying that. Actually, some of you might be thinking, there's a verse that comes to mind... It might just, there's a verse, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We will go there, but stay with me. We're going to journey through the Bible together, and we will see why I've come to the conclusion that I believe that God does indeed give us more than we can bear. So for the rest of our time today, we have three parts. We're going to do our sermon in three parts for the rest of our time today. Firstly, we're going to look at the Bible misconception that has led people to saying, God will not give you more than you can bear. I believe that's a misstatement, but there's a verse and there's some principles that kind of lead to that, and that's the first part. Secondly, we're going to spend a fair bit of time in the book of Job. So Job is a character that inevitably comes up when you do a Bible study on suffering and being able to bear. So you have to go to Job. That's the second part. And finally, the third part, we'll finish in Matthew 8 with Jesus and the disciples as we bring it all together and close with a few verses from the Gospels. Right. So let's start by turning to that often misquoted verse in the Bible that has to do with God giving us more than we can bear. Um, I'm going to ask Nadia to stand by to read some verses from me, because I feel like my throat is going. Um, honey, in fact, I might get you to read 1 Corinthians 10.13 for me, please. Creation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay. And we're thinking, ah, there it is. There it is right there. Yoshi, you're wrong. That is right there. Okay. That you will be able to bear it. Nothing has, you know, everything is common to man, right? Some, some, some maybe even have this verse memorized. It's a good verse to memorize if you want to memorize scripture. So God doesn't give us more than we can bear, right? The answer, is, is that right? Well, it's yes, yes, and no. That's the beauty and, I guess, danger of studying uh, or reading your Bible in the sense that you need to read it in its complete context. Um, otherwise, you are missing the point. So let me give you some, I guess, relatively trivial examples, right? Because we all know that Jonah was swallowed by a whale and Adam and Eve ate the forbidden apple, Correct. No, some of you are shaking heads. Jonah was not swallowed by a whale. In fact, we don't know if it's a whale. It's a, whale. It's a big fish. And there's nothing in the Bible that says that the fruit that um, Adam and Eve ate was an apple. I heard a preacher say this once. In fact, he was so confident, he said that it can't be an apple. It has to be a mango. And I'm like, what? Because after Adam ate the fruit, God says, man, Go. Out of the, yeah? Okay. I thought it was funny when I heard it. Thank you very much. Um, so, now, now um, the, the examples that I just gave you are, of course, trivial. But when it comes to bigger things like our topic for today, 
a single word, one or, or two words, can significantly change the meaning of a passage. So as pastors, I personally encourage you to read the Bible for yourself, to know God for yourself through the Bible and not just through pastors. Another quick example, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil, correct? No, money is not the root of all evil. I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. What does the Bible say? Well, very quickly, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Honey, can you read? 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay, so it is what? The love of money that is root of all evil, okay? It's amazing how one word can change the meaning so profoundly. So let's come back to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. I'll read it. No temptation has ta- overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. So this passage is clearly talking about temptation. Now let's break this down a little bit more. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. There's a number of things happening, which is interesting because if you read through 1 and 2 Corinthians, there are many things that are specific to the culture of that point in time for a number of reasons. I'm going to put up a map of Corinth, and I'm going to illustrate with a quick history and geography lesson. So that's Corinth right there you can see on the screen. That's a little, little bit right there, just a little bit right there on the red dot. It is only 5.6 kilometers across, so it's tiny, right? The people of Corinth made money from tourists, so they have been stuck on boats for days. They are coming from, say, uh, Macedonia and all this up the north, from Turkey, which is uh, Asia. They're coming through here, and they want to get to the other side. Um, So let me zoom out a little bit. So, okay. If they want to get from Asia, blah, 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 and all that, instead of going through the, the Mediterranean Sea and the Adria Sea, which is the open sea, they go through, effectively, that little bit there in Corinth to get to Rome. Now, if you're a man, if you're a sailor, what are you looking for the moment you get off the boat? It will be your last stop for a little while. It, it will not be the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church. Basically, you're looking for what the Bible calls in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The prevailing religion in the church in Corinth, where the church, this new church is situated, is the worship of the goddess Aphrodite. Some of you may have heard that before. Otherwise known as the goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, procreation, with temples complete with prostitutes that they call priestesses. So now you can understand the kind of situation that Corinth was in, and in a seemingly impossible situation, Paul writes to encourage the church in Corinth. No matter what is surrounding you, no temptation is too much for you to handle. Hang in there, God will provide a way out. So this verse that we've read, God is saying that He won't put you in a situation where you have no choice but to say yes to temptations, okay? God will not let us be tempted beyond what you can bear in terms of actually committing sin. So God is saying, you're not going to be in a situation that's so difficult where you're like, I guess I have to break God's law and and sin, okay? Now, what we're not talking about, we're not talking about situations of life, on what we're going through. We're not talking about sickness, pain, suffering. Those are not necessarily temptations. They can fall into it. But the suffering itself, God actually never said that you can bear all those things. What do I mean? We're going to come to Job. So we're going to read a passage in Job on screen in just a moment. But do you think Job was able to handle everything that he was going through, those of you who are familiar with Job. Do you think Job thought, yes, surely I can handle and deal with this, right? Well, let's, let's see what he had to go through. So Job chapter 1, verses 13 to 22. Um, honey, I'm going to get you to read it for me, if you can. Job um, <coughs> chapter 1, verses 13. 
One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they were dead. They are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Okay. So does this sound like you've read, you know, just a glimpse of what's happened, right? Does this sound like Job can go, oh, I can handle this? In fact, the Bible says here, he tore his robe and shaved his head. But then in verse 22, this next verse, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So Job did not sin. There might have been a temptation to sin, to curse God, to say all of these things. But even with everything that Job's going through, Job did not sin. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 goes through, uh, holds true. But let's go to chapter 2 of Job, starting in verse 7. I think I can read this. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Okay. So note here, God is allowing this. To happen. Um, I, I talked about this very briefly in last week's message. The devil is causing this in verse 8. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Again, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 holds true. But let's see what he actually felt. His state of mind, um, not his ability to handle temptation, but how he's handling the whole situation. Job chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Um, honey, can you, can you read for me? Um, Job chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish, and the night, it was said, a boy is born. That day, may it turn to darkness, may God above not care about it, may no light shine upon it. May darkness and deep sorrow claim it once more, may a cloud settle over it, may blackness overwhelm its light. So he's going through this, and that's how he's feeling, and we can read more of it, but let's have a look at verse 11. Job says this, Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Have any one of you ever felt this way? It's so overwhelming that you just wish that you were never born. Like, you don't know what to say, you're questioning everything, and you might be even feeling angry. Oh, because you're all, I'm sorry, I'm talking to saints, right? None of you have ever felt that. I've never been angry. Let's talk about anger for a moment. Anger is actually not sin. Do you know that? Well, why isn't it sin? Simple. Oftentimes, anger is merely a reaction, a result of something done to you. So it's kind of like being hurt. Um, It's not a sin to be hurt. It's what you do and what you think when you're angry, when that anger hits you, that's the sin. If you're unconvinced, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26 says this, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. 
Most of us, maybe all of us, have had feelings that sometimes overwhelm us, including anger. It's what we do with those feelings, whether we choose to lash, to react. That's the hard part. So coming back to Job, okay. So Job's friend Eliphaz says this to Job in Job chapter 4 and verse 7. Consider now who, being innocent, has ever perished. Where were the upright ever destroyed? You know what Eliphaz is saying? He's saying, maybe it's your fault, you know, the righteous person would never have to go through this. I mean, what happened? What did you do, right? Um, Because God doesn't give you more than you can bear. So if you had something that you can't handle, it's because you brought it upon yourself. Job's response is found in Job chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Then Job replied, if only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales... It would surely outweigh the end, the sand of the seas. No wonder my words may have been, uh, my, no, no wonder my words have been impetuous. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks in their poison. God's terrors are marshaled against me. I don't know about you, but it sure sounds to me like God is saying, or Job is saying, God is giving me a lot more than I can bear. How can God allow this to happen? Happen, and we ask the question that I alluded to last week, why? Why? You know, Job isn't the only person who felt this. Um, Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 3, He's just called fire down from heaven, right? But he was afraid and ran for his life. He came down, uh, he ran away, he sat under this tree, he prayed that he might die. He actually said, I have had enough. We could go into the story of Elijah or David. A lot of times we think of David as the one who slung the stone and he did all of that for sure. But in 2 Samuel 22 and verse 18, He says, my enemies were too strong for me. Like, what do you mean? You got five stones. You have a hundred more when you were king. And David says, my enemies were too strong for me. Church, when something feels like it's too much for you to bear, rest assured you are not alone. You are not alone. Well, we come back to the $10 million question. Why? Why? I'm not going to say I have an answer for you that will make all your worries and suffering just go away. Poof. That would be nice, wouldn't it? I must have missed that class when I was doing theology. Well, there's no such class. There's nothing that I say will make you go, ah. Last week, we talked about the books being opened um, and what will happen in the future as we ask why. We will have our answers, but that's a future answer. And now we come to the final part of our sermon. Um, We're going to see what the Bible has to say to us now when we ask the question, why now? when God gives us more than we can bear. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 25. Honey, can you read that for me? Matthew 8, 23 to 25. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. The disciples were very experienced fishermen. So they knew how to handle themselves. But right now, the waves are crashing and the boat is about to topple over. This is clearly what they weren't used to. This was clearly beyond what they were capable of handling. One of my favorite authors... In the Desire of Ages, Ellen White says this. Honey, can you read this for me? Just two slides. The evening had been calm and pleasant, and quiet rested upon the lake. But suddenly, darkness overspread the sky. The wind swept wildly down the mountain gorges along the eastern shore, and a fierce tempest burst upon the lake. 
The sun had set and the blackness of night settled down upon the stormy sea. The waves, lashed into fury by the howling winds, dashed fiercely over the disciples' boat and threatened to engulf it. Those hardy fishermen had spent their lives upon the lake and had guided their craft safely through many a storm, but now their strength and skill availed nothing. They were helpless in the grasp of the tempest, and hope failed them as they saw that their boat was filling. Absorbed in their efforts to save themselves, they had forgotten that Jesus was on board. Now seeing their labour in vain and only death before them, they remembered at whose command they had set out to cross the sea. In Jesus was their only hope. In Jesus was their only hope. Because friends... If we could handle things on our own, we wouldn't need God. Because if everything is things that we can handle, you know what we'd do? We'd handle it. How often do you think the disciples called upon Jesus in the storm? It is only when the situation was beyond them. You know, whatever the devil throws, us, throws at us in this life, when the storms of life hit, let me tell you that the devil's main goal isn't hurting you or me, it's hurting God. We're just collateral damage. We're, we're cannon fodder. We're just in the way. But God wants to intervene. However, unfortunately, sometimes... We are too busy handling it ourselves to let God intervene. Paul clearly experienced this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Some of us perhaps have never truly fallen on our knees in despair, just crying out, Lord, I don't know how to handle this until God allows something that's so overwhelming that we have no choice but to come to Him. If you are looking for an answer as to the suffering and the pain and heartache and the difficulty that you're going through or have been through, I don't have a specific answer for you if you're asking why, but I can say this for a fact. Like Job, David, Elijah, the disciples, God hears our cry because maybe for the first time, in your life, God has your full, undivided attention. You and I can finally learn to rely on Him, just like Job and David and Elijah and the disciples. And more often than not, like Job, it's the disciples that are, it's the, it's the devil that's causing it. But God is allowing it so that instead of us handling it by ourselves, we're so in, so over our heads that we have no choice but to go to Him. That is exactly what the disciples did. Here's what happened. He replied, you of little faith, <coughs> why are you so afraid? Then He got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? 
Even the winds and the waves obey him. And just like that, the disciples saw how incredible Jesus was. They saw him in a brand new light and were simply amazed at what he could do. He's, they've never seen that part of him before until they recognized that the situation was more than they can bear. I have one more verse to share with you. And we'll close. But quick snippet of bad news. Bad news. God won't always calm the storm, at least not immediately. He certainly didn't in this passage here. I don't know when he will or he won't calm the storm. But I can assure you that it is not God's will for you to suffer. I can say that for a fact if you have this question of why, <clears throat> let me read to you exactly what God's will is for us in Jesus' own words in John chapter 6, verses 38 to 40, our final passage for today. <coughs> I turned off the wrong thing. I turned that off. By the way, we need to disinfect this whole area. I have to read this passage, honey. Jesus says, yes, by the way, we really do need to wipe down this whole area. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, this is Jesus' own words, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise him up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. God loves us so much that if it means us getting hurt in the short term, if it means allowing things to happen, giving us things that we cannot handle so that he can have our full, undivided attention as much as it pains him, God has a bigger picture in mind and he's going to do it. Now, it's not easy because the devil doesn't make it easy, but God is infinitely more concerned about eternity than he is about this temporal body, this temporary body that he will recreate one day very soon when he comes again. Now, normally, a lot of preachers, like myself, like to close with a story. I've given you all the Bible verses, share a story, and I've done that plenty of times. The reason is simple, right? You just preach your hearts out, brought out these theological insights um, that God has impressed, you know, um, and a story makes it practical and real. So I do a lot of stories, and I normally get allergies when I'm doing those stories. But today, I don't have a story to close, not because I'm afraid of allergies acting up again. Here's why I don't have a story to close. The truth of the matter is, all of us here who are worshiping in person, those of you who are watching online, if you haven't already, you will have something that is just so much that you just can't bear it. That you just have no choice but to, to cry out to God things that may be so overwhelming that it's beyond our ability to handle. God does allow that to happen, just like with Job, with David, with Elijah, with the disciples. Maybe it'll be sickness and suffering. Maybe it's relationship challenges. Maybe it's marital breakdowns. Maybe it's betrayals of trust by people that you love. 
Maybe it's addictions and things that have held you in bondage. Maybe it's all of the above. The storms of life that come, the waves that crash against your boat, sometimes it will become too much for you to bear. That's when Jesus steps in. If we learn to tune our eyes and ears to him, he will be able to shine the brightest because while the devil is busy making life difficult for us, God is waiting for us to come to him like we've never come to him before. And for the first time in your life, as I've said, maybe God has your full undivided attention. As I invite our praise team, our wonderful guitarist and singers team to come up, may we reflect on continuing to make Jesus the cornerstone on which we build everything. So that when things happen beyond what we can bear, we can go straight to this cornerstone. We can go straight to Jesus. Let's sing.